uh, Health Center and ask Sandra if you can please uh, share with us uh, a land acknowledgement, Sandra. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. I'm sorry, I'm having trouble with my camera. I'm going to try to fix that afterwards, but um, can you hear me okay? We can. Okay, great. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we would like to start today by recognizing that our work takes place on diverse traditional Indigenous territories across Ontario. We acknowledge that the Office of the RNAO is located on the traditional territory of the Huron-Wendat, Haudenosaunee, and most recently the territory of the Mississaugas of the New Credit. Here in Thunder Bay, we're on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe of the Fort William First Nation, and we are treaty people of the Robinson Superior Treaty of 1850. We invite each one of you to take a moment now to reflect on the traditional territory that you find yourself on today as you participate in this meeting. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sandra, and welcome everybody. Uh, so let's just for a second look at the agenda and uh, uh, share what we will be doing today um, alongside with you. And please do send questions at any time if you have questions uh, using the bubble on the uh, Zoom webinar. And uh, we will be uh, told when there are questions and we will stop and uh, ensure that we respond to those questions. So it's not a lecture, but really it's more of a conversation and also that you have your queries and uh, communities and I will ask a of policy uh, um, I'll wait to give an um, and uh, that was interesting that we don't get you uh, all confused. Um, let's move with that. This is the not working the PowerPoint. You can give us a hand. I'm not sure if I have a hand. Uh, so and can we move this to the side? So, thank you. Sorry about that, guys. We will be with you in a second. Okay, very good. So just a reminder for you of the changes that are happening in the health system. Um, as much as we are informed, we are keeping you informed. Um, six organizations uh, have been um, brought together into the Ontario Health Agency. These are CCO, HQO, eHealth, Gift of Life, HSSO and Health Force Ontario. And then a new uh, center of excellence has been created. In fact, the announcement was yesterday, and that's the Mental Health and Addiction Center of Excellence, which was announced uh, by the minister yesterday. And we can send you after the webinar, uh, the press release. Um, just as an aside, uh, well, or maybe I will refer to it later, on. Um, then there are five regional offices, and these five regional offices are offshoots of the Ontario Health Agency. So they are Ontario Health Regional Offices that oversee um, what's happening in that region. 
uh, the five of five temporary leads or, or uh, yeah, temporary leads. And then from there is the Ontario Health Teams and we will review with you how many exist, how many uh, have applied on the second round, etc. And then the public health entities, which still is a discussion on uh, what will be the number and where they will be located, etc. And the consultation is ongoing. What I wanted to mention about the center that was announced yesterday is that what RNO is asking is that actually mental health and addictions be well integrated with Ontario health teams, that it not be separate. And moreover, um, when we are talking about um, uh, conditions that are on level one and two, that actually that be integrated with primary care so that um, children, adolescents or adults with um, experiences, for example, of anxiety or the such, uh, do not wait and wait and wait until they get uh, really um, seen uh, so that it really is part of primary care and that um, uh, parents, which is happening currently, don't need to stay home with children uh, um, because they don't have the necessary services. So we are very hopeful that this uh, center of excellence uh, will uh, advance that. Um, so far in what we have seen, uh, I am not exactly sure of how much the connection is with Ontario Health Teams between the Center of Excellence or how much um, detail is or when the details will come in relationship to the integration with primary care, which to us is absolutely uh, necessary. To remind you, the Ontario Health Teams are groups of providers and organizations from a variety of sectors um, that are clinically and fiscally accountable for delivering the full and coordinated continuum of care to a geographic, to a defined geographic population. Uh, all, all of the ones that we are involved, and actually all of them, have primary care, have home care, have hospital care. I would say that most of them have mental health and addictions. Uh, not all of them have long-term care, including not all of the ones we are working with. So long-term care is another piece to bring more to the forefront um, if we are going to wrap around services around people. Um, when it says here, and this is a slide from the government of uh, clinically and fiscally accountable, at this stage is more clinically than fiscally. They don't have a common uh, pot of funding, but at maturity, the idea is that they will move into common funding allocation and they will be able to move funding from one sector to another if they see the need to strengthen a specific sector. Within this, of course, comes the issue of um, the lens that uh, are uh, no longer links, but are on these five agencies that we mentioned before, the regional offices, bring all of those together too. And within that comes the role of uh, nursing and other health professionals that currently are working clinically out of the links. For example, care coordinators, for example, uh, the palliative care nurses, the mental health nurses, et cetera. And RNO has communicated with government, and uh, all of this is public. If you are interested, we can send to you of where we believe those positions uh, should be located, starting with care coordination. That right now there are a thousand care coordinators in hospitals. We believe those should remain in hospitals as discharge planners. Uh, we have always had in hospital discharge planners and always have been arranged. And that then the remaining. Uh, which is about 3,500 or more, be located mainly in primary care to really support both an, a more upstream approach, so not the current role, that is very much a control and management of how many home care visits, but actually more upstream of health promotion, disease prevention, coordination, and then health system navigation. It is important to mention that in context of this, 
There was also an announcement a, a week ago or two weeks ago, it all looks like a, a blur of time to me, uh, which was about the um, a home care services and the, um, the a review of both the legislation and the regs for, the home, for home care. And uh, some things will remain the same and we can send to you. And some things like the cap on hours will not be there. And the fact that care coordinators can be located not only at the lean level, but actually both at the OHT or in sectors within the OHT, that type of change will enable that. To remind you of where we are, so in the first round, um, 31 OHTs put the application uh, or, the, or the letter of intent out of the 31, 30, uh, sorry, that is incorrect. Over 100 put the, the, the letter of intent, 130 or 40 if I recall. But 31 were invited for a full proposal, 30 put the full proposal, and 24 were accepted. And then the remaining six uh, is up to them when they resubmit the proposal. And as Phil Graham, who is in charge of this file, has said, um, it's not if they will be accepted, it's more of when, depending on when they uh, apply, when they send the revised proposal based on the feedback. Uh, the second round, 41 organizations have put proposals and they will hear sometime in the fall, although timelines may change now with COVID-19 and other priorities, uh, but they will hear sometime in the fall or later on this year in terms of which ones will move forward. Um, in terms of the OHTs that RNO is working with, we are working currently with four and we are about to accept two or three more as we speak. And then we are in conversations both with other OHTs as well as of, of the ministry uh, because this, the, the work is very, very intense. So the four that we already accepted at, are North Western Toronto, the East Toronto Health Partners, South Lake Community, and Ottawa East Health Team. And with this, with three of them, we already did the first champion training. And that was a two and a half day training uh, that was absolutely spectacular. Um, seeing partners from all the sectors, uh, from all the disciplines, both regulated and unregulated, working together, ranging from, from anywhere between 80 participants to 130, depending on the size of the OHD, has been for Susan, Olivia, and myself that lead this, in, this initiative, and for uh, Madison that comes and take pictures, or Marianne, has been nothing short of inspiring uh, both the desire for them to work together, to really offer to people the best of their expertise. And because the first guideline that we're implementing is person and family-centered care, to also understand that although we offer our expertise, we cannot be the drivers of people's lives. They, their lives belong to them. So um, this is an important message. And uh, whether they are in the hospital or in primary care or in home care or wherever they are, that is their home for the time that they are there. And as I keep saying, even if it's in the hospital, we go home and we sleep in our bed. They are stuck in the hospital and they don't go home to sleep in their bed. So that's their home for the time that they are there. So we need to respect their decisions and respect their wishes and be there for people. Um, so the two guidelines that are mandatory for any of the OHDs that work with us are person and family center care and care transitions. And then they choose two other uh, clinical guidelines. And what this allows them is to move the quadruple aim of uh, improving their experience in the health system, whether it's a person or a community or a program or people in a program in the case of public health 
It also allows them to improve the outcomes of people. Uh, for example, if they will use the guideline on false prevention, which some are using, compression injury prevention, it will allow them to uh, improve their outcomes. If they're using the, the guideline on substance use, it also will allow them to improve their outcomes. And then of course, if you start to decrease complications, uh, whether it is from falls, injuries after a fall, or pressure injuries, or lack of lactation um, uh, support, et cetera, et cetera, depending on what's the guideline, uh, we will be able to lower uh, the cost of care in a positive way, simply because of having less complications, uh, it will lower the cost and it will give people a higher quality of life and satisfaction and health outcomes. And alongside with that, because it is health professionals that are doing this work uh, with people regardless of the sector, uh, and if we engage health professionals in the right way, we'll also improve the provider experience. And this is what uh, we saw in the training of champions that we did. The level of engagement, the level of enthusiasm, the level of commitment uh, was simply inspiring and contagious. And we have no doubt that they will be, go back to the workplace and share, and, uh, exp uh, share that experience with others and the learnings with others. So uh, a bit of what you can see uh, uh, in the, so this is how the Ontario, the Northwestern Toronto BPSO HD ended. And the same as I cannot speak now because it's too loud, it was actually exactly the same there. They didn't let us finish when we were trying to do closing remarks. They went with lights and everything. And now it has become a bit of a, um, a bit of a symbol because all the OHTs that we're working with actually end up in that way, doing the wave song. Uh, which is very apropos our work on social movement that we are doing. So uh, we were very uh, pleased that the uh, Minister Elliot um, stopped by on the Toronto East OHD uh, to say hi to people and to share how proud she was of their work. Uh, in the morning, we always start with the CEOs that welcome everybody from their organizations and um, share their um, uh, inspiration and their uh, admiration for the frontline care providers that are driving this work. And they also come at the end of the two and a half days training to actually pin uh, with the BPSO pin, uh, each one of uh, the staff. Um, and it has been just very beautiful. There is a cake, I forgot the cake a BPSO cake in each one of the events. And what you can see in the picture um, from the tweet from Peggy Hughes is that actually what we did yesterday in the Toronto, the South Lake in the South Lake, um, in the South Lake community BPSO HD is that we had different groups pinning one another. So was the paramedics and the, pub and the public health pinning one another and it was the commissioner uh, pinning uh, people in, in, um, in paramedics also, and we had the patient family rep in actually all the BPSOHDs. We have patient and, and uh, family reps, and they are um, just by themselves an inspiration. So they actually share their thoughts early in the morning when the CEOs of all the organizations are talking, the patient rep or the family rep also shares what are their aspirations for this initiative. And then they stay throughout the event. And I would say it's not so much they keep us on our toes, but they are with us in ensuring that we walk the talk and that we work together to where they think these things should be going. So it has been fantastic. And with that, I will stop maybe for a few minutes for questions if there are, and then I pass it on to Matt and then to Sabrina. Yes, um, there was a couple of questions, uh, mainly about care coordination. So uh, Stacy is, she said um, that she was wondering about managers in terms of um, will they be going to primary care or hospitals to care coordinate?
managers. The managers of care coordinators mm -hmm. or the care coordinators yeah. no, themselves? No, because you spoke to the care, about the care coordinators, but the managers as well. Yeah. So RNO has focused mainly on the actually 4,500 care coordinators. Um, uh, however, that's not to say if you have ideas, please send us a note. We would not want any of you, let me be clear about that, and that's what we are extremely attentive now. We wouldn't want any position to evaporate. And I say it with cheek, tongue and cheek, but not really, because you know, people find new, new roles, new work, new places to work, and I wouldn't want we wouldn't want from our NEO, even by attrition to this position starting to shrink because primary care and the OHTs and primary care also outside of OHTs are so, so thirsty for more resources. No one is offering more funding. So at least let's give them the fantastic resources that we had uh, centralized at the lean level uh, to primary care or other community centers or other community agencies like mental health and addictions, et cetera, uh, shelters. Like I can, we were talking with policy and with Matt and my colleagues. There are so many organizations that would benefit from your expertise. So if you have a view, please send me an email. Um, at the end, you will have my email. We would love to hear from you, but we want to make sure that we don't lose any positions. I don't know if that helps, but we would like to hear from you. Okay, and I think that you've probably addressed some of this um, from Teresa. She, she writes that care coordinators are already embedded in clinics, hospitals, and community with primary, key, primary care team attachments. She's wondering about um, the role of care coordination or your understanding of care coordination because you're expressing a desire to have care coordinators return to clinical Located, practice. located yeah. in primary okay. care, and that's not the case Lo now. Yeah, and so she's saying care coordination is a skilled profession, and these nurses have chosen this field as a career move. That's so true, that's more? true. Yeah. It is a very, very important, and that's why we want to ensure that we don't lose any of these positions, but given that they will not be at the lean in a few months, you know, from now, and that actually primary care is ready to take them. The, the, the kind of rational excuse, reality sometimes is reality, sometimes is, it's a say by, by whoever, that primary care doesn't have the capacity to absorb it is not the case. There are many, many primary care settings whether it's nurse practitioner-led clinics, family health teams, community health centers, uh, HAYACs that are eager to have care coordinators collocated as part of their team. So that's what we mean by that, if that helps. Enough tip for the question. Excellent. So I will pass it on, and then if there are questions, people can put them. Mm -hmm. uh, Matt, you are, you are it. Do I take the command chair? You take the command chair. Yes. <laughs> All right. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Matthew Kelway, Director of Nursing and Health Policy with RNAO. And we thought it was important before you start discussing some of the practice issues this afternoon to provide a bit of policy context. Uh, the work I'm going to uh, explain to you in about two minutes time um, uh, is happening alongside the practice work that you'll be hearing about uh, this afternoon and informed and supported by uh, RNAO's BPG staff, specifically Sabrina Morali and, and Grace Suva, and I'm thankful for their uh, knowledge and indeed wisdom uh, in supporting this work. The first uh, thing I want to bring to your attention is the renewal of a letter of partnership that RNAO has signed with the Chiefs of Ontario. Um, I'm going to uh, quote from that uh, letter now so that you understand what it's about. It is a commitment by RNAO and the Chiefs of Ontario to continue their work together and urging all orders of government to address the mental, physical, social, and economic inequities experienced by First Nations people caused by a history of discriminatory policies that have created crises in mental health, addiction, suicides, and overall poor health. So the priorities that we uh, set out in this letter of partnership um, include mental health and addiction and specifically suicides, um, include improving social and environmental uh, determinants of health 
and improving health services across uh, care sectors, including primary public health, home, and community care. Um, we will be renewing a work plan as well, and most certainly that work plan will include uh, the delivery of high quality and culturally safe nursing uh, to First Nations communities across uh, the province. The second um, thing that I wanted to bring to your attention is a relationship accord that's being agreed to between RNAO and the Anishinaabe Aski Nation. Um, you will see, do we have the slide, is that up? Um, yeah, there's the slide. So that slide shows the signing ceremony that we had between the Chiefs of Ontario, that's Carmen Jones, uh, the health director with the Chiefs of Ontario signing uh, that letter of partnership uh, alongside Doris uh, there. We have no pictures of the uh, what we're calling relationship accord with uh, NAN because it is uh, so fresh, but there is uh, most certainly an agreement to be working together. Uh, some of you may know in 2017, NAN signed a charter with uh, the Crown, both Ontario and federal uh, governments that commits the parties to work in a renewed multilateral uh, nation to nation relationship with a commitment to immediate, medium and long-term transformative changes to the existing health system at NAN community level. That transformation is based on NAN's assertion of their jurisdiction over and right to determine and control their health care as reflected in the uh, early initiative under the charter to establish a health commission. So RNAO uh, has agreed to this relationship accord with NAN respecting and supporting their right to self-determination and their objective of health system transformation on their territory. Um, so th that's the policy piece. And with that, I'm done and handing over to Sabrina. But maybe there are questions. Maybe there are questions. Are there questions? On the policy piece. Yes. Sure. No questions at this time. Certainly. On the policy. Well, I'll hang out in case they come up. OK, thank you. That's fantastic. And thank you, Matt, for that kind and warm introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sabrina Morelli. I'm the program manager and a registered nurse for the Supporting Indigenous Health Program at the RNAO. Um, I wanted to just talk a little bit about the program overall so you get an understanding of the program feel and what it is about. And then I really do want to turn it over to our colleagues who are with us today, and I'll introduce them momentarily. So the Supporting Health Interventions Program, or initiative rather, aims to develop meaningful partnership with First Nations, Inuit, and Métis communities across Ontario to co-develop and lead programming that is responsive and supportive of the health and wellness of Indigenous people across Ontario. The initiative is founded on uh, the principles of social determinants of health, health equity, and based on Indigenous knowledge, values, and beliefs. As you can see in the screen right now, this is our program model. Matt talked about our creation of our meaningful partnerships, co-creation, and co-collaboration. We recognize that work that we are currently doing cannot be done in isolation and needs to be done and guided by Indigenous communities across Ontario. We also have a pillar of best practice guideline development, and I will get into that momentarily, as well as uh, developing an Indigenous focused BPSO designation. So Matt talked about our first pillar, so I won't go through that, but it's really talking about the need for meaningful partnership, co-creation and collaboration and doing the work that we're doing in partnership and led by Indigenous communities and people. Pillar two is the development of a best practice guideline and, and it will be a series of guidelines eventually that are focused specific on Indigenous communities themselves where the topics are, are driven by the needs and the, and the requests of Indigenous communities. So we are currently in the development phase of our first best practice guideline for um, Indigenous communities, which will be published in August of 2020, so later this year. And the purpose is really to determine evidence-based practices that address commercial tobacco cessation for pre and postnatal Indigenous women, their families, and communities. The scope of the guideline will be relevant to all health sectors, Indigenous health centers, and social service organizations and communities where Indigenous women both pre and postnatal women, their families, and their communities reside. So I expect to see that soon as well coming out. Our third and final pillar is the creation of a tailored BPSO designation for Indigenous communities and organizations. We are very pleased to have eight Indigenous BPSOs as part of our team, 
And these organizations range from Aboriginal health care access centers, primary care centers, community health centers, social service organizations, as well as communities themselves. And we're working alongside our partners uh, to create a program that honors Indigenous values, beliefs, and knowledge. And similar to all BPSOs, we're looking at that lens, but how do we create evidence-based practice cultures through systematic implementation of guidelines and evaluation of those guidelines using an Indigenous lens? So at this time, it is my absolute pleasure and privilege to actually introduce you to our team today. And I've been told that their pictures will come up on the camera, so we'll see if that happens. The first individual I'd like to introduce you to is Sandra Sabo. She is uh, standing right beside the Anishwabi Mushkiki banner on the right in the, uh, I think it's a forest green top. Um, and Sandra is a registered nurse and a diabetes educator with Anishwabi Mushkiki, Aboriginal Health Access Centre in Thunder Bay. She works with an interdisciplinary team to support and educate clients and families. She currently is the BPSO lead for Anishwabi Mushiki and is working alongside of our team with the program. The next individual I'd like to um, introduce you to is in the middle picture on the left of the RNAO sign. And this is Cheryl Yost. Cheryl Yost is a registered nurse and the nurse in charge at Sandy Lake First Nations Community. She has served as an RNAO member and the president of chapter two and was on the board of directors of RNAO. Cheryl is also one of our co-leads um, in Sandy Lake. The third person I'd like to introduce you to is in the next picture on the left. And this is Greta Mikis. Greta has been working as a community health worker at Sandy Lake First Nation since 2007. And she supports her community across the lifespan. Her experience extends from both the perinatal um, period and supporting women in that period early childhood development and continues into providing home and palliative care. She's also the co-lead of our BPSO program in Sandy Lake. And the final person I'd like to introduce you to is Lindsay. Lindsay's on the right of the third picture. And Lindsay is a community health worker working at Sandy Lake First Nations. She supports pre and postnatal women in their journey as well as early childhood education. And she is also the co-lead of the BPSO program in Sandy Lake. So I will now turn it over to um, Sandra to lead us through the remainder of the presentation. So Sandra, can you advance your slides? I'm not sure. <laughs> I, okay. might, I, I will just say next and maybe you can help me out with that. Thank sure. you. Well, hi everyone, we finally got our video working here so we're very excited. Um, I'd like to start by, um, on behalf of everyone here, thanking RNAO, um, especially Doris, Susan, and Sabrina for inviting us all here to um, speak today about um, our organizations and our work with the BPSO program. Um, I'm going to start with a little bit of an overview about Anishinaabe Mishkiki, and then I'll speak a little bit more about our work with BPSO. Anishinaabe uh, Mishkiki is an Aboriginal Health Access Centre, one of 10 across the province. Aboriginal Health Access Centres are Aboriginal-led primary health care organizations. Uh, they were announced in the mid-1990s, and by the year 2000, all 10 were operational. So we're about the same age as the BPG program at RNAO, I believe. We're turned 20 now, and uh, we've made it through those awkward teenage years, so we're Hitting our stride, I think. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, and if you could just, yep, bring that up, that's great. Uh, we're located in beautiful Thunder Bay, Ontario. Um, here's, as you can see on the map, where we're located. Um, for those of you who've not been to Thunder Bay, we're about a 1,300 kilometer drive from Toronto, so a pretty good uh, drive away. Also, we're about 800 kilometers east of Winnipeg and uh, northwest of Sault Ste. Marie. So we're the really largest um, urban center for a good eight hours to either side of us. Our city population is about 108,000, uh, but we are the urban hub that serves a community of about 250,000 people across the Northwest region. Uh, next, uh, click, there we go. Uh, this is one of our most famous landmarks. It's uh, uh, the Nanabiju, the spirit of the great, uh, the deep sea water. Uh, in English, he's known as the sleeping giant. He's out in our harbor there. <laughs> okay. Uh, so our AHAC serves urban First Nation, Métis, and Inuit clients residing in Thunder Bay. 
some of whom are from Thunder Bay originally, some are from other urban centers, but many have come from the catchment area of 50 plus First Nation communities, about half of which are remote. By remote, I mean that the community is only accessible by plane, except in an increasingly short period of time by winter road. Um, and so if you look at this map and you sort of cut it in half horizontally, most of the communities or all of the communities that are in red that would be north of that horizontal line would be remote communities fly in access only. So quite a few of them. Um, our clients come to Thunder Bay for healthcare, education, job opportunities, and other services that are not available to them in their own communities or in smaller outlying communities. The official statistics tell us that about 10% of Thunder Bay's population is Indigenous, but we know these statistics don't represent the true numbers and the proportion is in fact quite a bit higher. Uh, next slide. Where did I go? Oh, sorry, there we go. <laughs> so at our clinic, uh, we work in interdisciplinary teams. We have traditional knowledge keepers on staff, nurse practitioners, physicians, dietitians, registered nurses, registered practical nurses, social workers, early childhood educators, teachers, and support staff. Um, and we've tried to reflect the same diversity on our steering committee with the BPSO work that we're doing. So we have um, various parts of our clinic that are represented on our steering committee, and we have many non-nurses that sit on our steering committee. Next. So we are implementing the Person and Family Center Guideline here at Meshkiki. Uh, it was quite an obvious choice for us when we were looking through uh, where to start with this program. It's really the foundation of what we're all about as an organization and it aligns very well with Indigenous beliefs around the centrality of family and community and seeing people and their health as whole units, not broken up into specialties or organ systems or even individuals depending on the situation. Uh, we are working on many of the system level recommendations at this time, specifically around staff training, patient feedback, care environments, um, to build on and formalize a lot of the good work that's already happening here. Also recognizing that those systems, um, system pieces provide us a foundation for future work. In many cases, we've been able to align our BPSO objectives with other requirements, for example, from Health Quality Ontario. I don't know if that's what's still what it's called, but the organization formerly known as Health Quality Ontario and our own internal strategic plan, which has helped to quite significantly with data collection and sustainability of our program. Okay, next. So this is the evidence-based practice model that many of you might be familiar with. Um, Anishinaabe Mishkiki joined the BPSO program for a variety of reasons. Um, some of the more important ones to our organization, I think internally were to help us identify gaps, improve practices, and reduce variability of care where appropriate to promote the best health outcomes for our patients. But really more importantly, it's, it's an external tool for us to be able to provide leadership in Indigenous healthcare and in healthcare in general, I believe. And I would say the same thing about all of the partners that we're working with in this cohort. They're all leaders in their communities and um, are paving the way for other organizations. Um, we're constantly adapting and learning, uh, finding new ways to integrate best practice with the piece of lived experience for our communities. Um, I know that RNAO is working on the next version of their implementation toolkit uh, we heard a little bit about it at the Knowledge Exchange event last year, um, getting at more of the how grassroots movements and community knowledge um, enhances uh, evidence uh, into practice. And I think that community knowledge um, is a really great addition to this evidence-based model. And I've sort of added a fourth, I took the liberty of adding a fourth arrow there to represent that traditional or that community knowledge um, it certainly has been, and in many cases continues to be the dominant form of knowledge in Indigenous communities. Um, as I reflected on some of the similarities between the Ontario Health um, Teams program that's happening 
and the Indigenous Focus Program, uh, I really thought about how we're sort of both in pioneering mode, meaning we've, we've got two hats on as we do some of our work. We're always thinking about our own organizations and moving um, our own projects forward, but we, we also walk the path of um, working, working to build a program for those that will come behind us um, and setting a strong foundation for those other organizations. Um, and I think that that's really how we move forward as communities and as a society. So uh, I look forward to hearing more about the great work that the health teams are doing and uh, sharing more about what our uh, cohort is doing as well. So thank you. Thank you. So we'll turn it over to Gina, Cheryl, and Lindsay to um, talk about their BPSO journey as well. Hello, I'm Greta Mikas and Lindsay is here and Cheryl. And next slide. We are located northwestern Ontario, closest to the Manitoba border. And as you can see through the diagram, that we're the furthest northern form of BPSO in Ontario. And we're located 266 kilometers north of Red Lake, Ontario. And it's a fly-in and winter road access only. 3,065. INAC on reserve and 2256 and off reserve 405 in 2016. And next slide, please. And so we selected, we were selected due to the high rate of substance tobacco usage in Sandy Lake. And we selected the person family center care as our first step to establish team and most important to gain trust for both clients and health workers in Sandy Lake. And this is to learn from each other and to share knowledge and find balance. Cheryl, you have anything else to say? You're, you're muted. I there think. we go. I think that's um, primarily yet. The part that we looked at was not only the substance use, but the tobacco use, but the substance use because of what is happening within our region itself. And, uh, and the guidelines, I mean, we had any number of guidelines that we could have chosen um, during that time, but these ones spoke to us the most. And they were the ones that when we brought it back to the steering committee with our elders that they really uh, felt most receptive to. Okay. All right, uh, next. And there's us, there's uh, our health director, Joan Ray, and assistant Ambrose, myself, and Cheryl, and Lindsay. And these are the three practice guidelines that we plan to implement in the future. I'll just make one addition to what she said. This was a year ago now that we headed to Toronto. And you, when you see the look on their faces with Lindsay and with Greta, that's exactly what they looked like because they didn't know what they had gotten themselves into. But today they step up to the plate and there they are presenting and it's just fantastic. Um, the health director, be it Joan Ray and um, Ambrose Siedler, have been very instrumental in supporting us in this process and the linkages with the uh, health board in Sandy Lake, as well as the band council in Sandy Lake and the elders that really carry this as well. Next slide. All right, and uh, we have a uh, steering committee selected and accepted on May 31. 2019 and the steering committee it consists of one elder two traditional healers one gokum one mother and mental health practitioners and prenatal supporters and we were done our gap analysis on august 14 2019 and prior matrix was 
selected with steering committee on September 11. And Sandy Lake BPSO online presentation, we did that with uh, telehealth online and that was to recruit champions and that was done on October 4. And four, there was four champions. We have four champions <laughs> and we have more planned. And here, here is our recommendations we have selected. One, 1.1, 1 1.4, 1 2.2, and that's from the person, person family centered care guideline. And 5.2 is from the communication recommendation. And in all, we selected these recommendations in order to gain trust with our clients and plus the workers that way we can work together to to improve our health care yeah <laughs> Cheryl no I think I think you spoke to this quite nicely and once people start into the BPSO once they have uh, identified as a BPSO and working with the clinical practice guidelines more, that this really stands out. And really the gist of it was, we needed to improve our communication. We needed to provide a process that we could work together. We needed to gain their perception, be it within our patient population, was the prenatals. At the time we started, we had 15 um, fem uh, women that were pregnant. And uh, we also had about five out of the community. That, that was a year ago now. And I said to Greta, what had happened a year ago and what happened before that? Because we're back to 15 again with five out of the community. Whereas we can go up as high as, we've been up as high as 49, 50 that were pregnant. And usually we settle right around 35. So not sure about March, but anyway, we'll see what, whether this is a trending. But with this, it's really looking at our uh, gap analysis and our priority matrix. And with the priorities, our priorities are really the overall is to build that capacity, but it's to improve our communication and to build and provo provide that uh, process. And that's, that's where Greta, Lindsay, Carmel are working with us within the nursing station and part of our team. And we're working with them in reaching out into the community, which is something that has not been done on a regular basis before. And so they're doing home visits. They're going out and doing uh, evaluations one-on-one -on -one with the new moms, with the, with the partners, with the family. And uh, not only are these two um, working with the Early Start program, but they're also with Carmel, they have also been identified. They're now certified dualists and they come in when we do deliveries. We try not to do deliveries within the nursing station. We try to get them out of the community two weeks, of, uh, two weeks prior, but that does not always happen. And babies tend to have a mind of their own. They come when they want to. And so we, ha we have to be ready to deliver at any given point in time. And this is where these three ladies really support us in this endeavor with this cultural background to help with that. The one, which is Carmel, and she wasn't able to be here today, um, she is also looking at going on into the midwifery program, working within the First Nations communities, and that's fantastic. So anyway, I'll leave it at that. There's so much we could say, but I'll uh, move forward in building that capacity. There is, a lot, there is a lot of community involvement with a birth that happens in Sandy. There is, and the first time, I, or one of the first times I experienced it was a young mom that it wasn't her first delivery. And I was checking her contractions and I looked up and there's the mom, there's the dad of the babe, there's the two gookums, there's the great gram, as well as there must have been 30 to 50 people out in the hall waiting, wait, waiting for this delivery to occur. And I'll tell you, the, the sense that it gave me, it was such a warm feeling to look and see this happening and uh but you know what things can go wrong too so the babe as i said has a mind of their own and uh so we have to make sure we've got all our our services in place in order to support this um 
um, <clears throat> and engage local programs to support building a healthy baby and family. And here we have our, our local programs in Sandy Lake and uh, we preferred using this diagram to show straight out who is involved and outside of the structure is who we plan to introduce into the program in the future because it is a it is a, we are building and the baby mom dad and family is our center Next slide. <coughs> Next step, listen and observe and evaluate. Right. More involvement with steering committees as a team for baby and family. Integrate tobacco and residents with <coughs> Um, with uh, anticipation, with oh. anticipation of update guideline in 2020, evaluation of practice, build trust, one-on-one -on -one contact with surveys, and consider and more. Mm -hmm. We've gone, we've gone to households ourselves just to go deliver surveys for yeah. our. For our evaluation because we feel that one-on-one -on -one contact with the client with the family is best and that way it it builds our trust and and we can we listen to the client and where we are there to listen mm -hmm. we we have our um, I don't know. <laughs> yeah Cheryl? I think the other part is, I want to give recognition for this uh, picture here. That's a talking stick. And it was something that one of our registered nurses in the public health uh, program actually um, made. And there are some mornings when we do staff report that everybody wants to talk at once. And so we've started now in handing that talking stick around and so that people can be succinct. They have the opportunity to talk. But when they hand it on to the next, they have to be prepared to listen. And I know so many times, and what I was told when I first came to the North, and this was from a um, First Nations person from Manitoulin Island. And, he, and I said to him, what do I need to take with me? He said, you know what, just listen. Just listen and watch. And one of our men that work within our um, operations and maintenance in the station, uh, he says to me, I listen and I watch. I listen and I watch and I see so much. And it's very true if you take the time to listen. So when you look at this evaluation, it came out of need. The need was because we ran out of petroleum within the community itself. We didn't have gas for to get the van out to pick up the ladies to bring them in. And so in order to support this, we had our own, the, the staff uh, such as Greta and Lindsay go to the homes themselves. And they handed out the, um, the actual evaluation, and then they went back and picked them up. They also talked to them at the time. And this was one way, so that's when we say and considering more, because we're looking at what else we can do to really do the evaluation, because evaluation is different within our community than it is in many other areas in the region itself. Um, because people do want to, um, they will take time to listen themselves, but they want to be heard and they want to get their points across as well. So again, when we look at the involvement with the steering committee, and this was uh, with baby and family, it was building this overall umbrella. And with all of the ones we are, that have been involved in that process, we are so fortunate because the power that's there is amazing. And here is our spectrum of services, prevention, promotion, curative, urgent, emergent, rehabilitative, <laughs> supportive, and palliative. 
and and um and the and the lady in the white sweater is our mom from our steering committee and below that is our gokum from our steering committee so they were part of our um our our launch during uh health day and below beside the gokum is uh carmel which who can couldn't be here and that was during uh preschool checkups so we do a wide range of um activities we're there for the child before birth till the age six and beyond if needed and on top is myself i was um we were having an appointment and thank you cheryl for posting that picture it's my late mother mm. <laughs> nice mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah you know, it's amazing and just shows you how much community is so important. And that year will be coming up in June, is it not, Greta? Yep. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so when you look at all of this, look at the activities that have occurred and look at the, I mean, right from these ladies have organized, they call them onesies. Uh, they make onesies for the babies and they pull the um, new moms, potential moms in together and they sew the onesies, they make moccasins, they make rattles, they make decabissons uh, for them to use. And so it's a case of integrating that in and at the same time, then they have the opportunity to talk because to sit and look at each other and talk is just not where it's at. But by doing this, it really is the opportunity for them to reflect and to share as well. And up until now, we are up until the last year, we have been sitting within the nursing station and we had the same programs as that previous slide with looking at prevention and so on. And then there were the programs in the community. We didn't cross over that much. And so we had to start looking at how can we cross over? So to start with the prenatal program is the place we're starting, but we know this is just the beginning. So the next step is going to be moving on into other areas. And our overall goals is to optimize team efficiencies and duplication, limitations, blurring process, circle of care. Restorative practice, start with the prenatal population in Sandy Lake. Cheryl, yeah. Substance abuse, mental wellness, person-centered, breastfeeding, diabetes. One of the studies that was done in the, uh, with the Sioux Lookout First Nations Health Authority was looking at the four major reasons that um, youth went to eMERGE. And what we found out was substance use, mental health, um, or mental wellness, we call it, as well as um, skin was one and we haven't taken that on at this point in time but the other was um, pregnancy and so those were the three areas that we decided that we would work with also we found out that even though individuals may start breastfeeding when they're in the um the hospitals be it winnipeg thunder bay or sioux lookout where they primarily deliver um when they do the breastfeeding there the problem is within six weeks they've probably stopped breastfeeding so we're needing to look at how we can um, entice and encourage individuals to continue on. No. Okay. Um, okay. I, I just came to realize that I've been, un, I've been muted. So I'll start again. 
And thank you all for this excellent presentation. There are some comments um, in the chat box about really appreciating what you were saying and um, enjoying your visuals. And there are also some questions that I wanted to bring forth. My name is Susan and I'm supporting RNAO at the back end and supporting the BPSO program in general. So uh, the first question is from Grace and Grace is wondering if you can explain more about how evaluation data is collected during your one-to-one -one visits. So for example, um, she's wondering if you use a form or if it's interviews or storytelling. And she also says, excellent presentation. Um, and, uh, but I'll start with that question. Uh, what we did in the past was we went and, and we went and uh, dropped off some surveys. And this last survey we did was for patient satisfaction survey. And if, if they had time, we would, I would sit there with them and ask them to fill it out. And sure, some of them filled it out, but uh, and then I would go back in a few days and we would pick it up. Okay. So it's printed out on the paper. Yeah. yeah. And then you provide support or encouragement and follow up if needed. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Uh, Grace has an answer. Oh. Oh, sure. I was just going to add when we when we do some of our patient surveys, um, we we have a paper option for people, but then we also have the option for them to sit with one of our workers and actually help them fill it out. Um, sometimes it's a language issue; lang uh, English may not be their first language. Sometimes they're there with a care partner, so we can kind of do a double survey. Um, but we, we are also looking at things like um, focus groups, more storytelling based um, evaluation because uh, we tend to, um, yeah, you, you don't get the same results generally when you're just sending out a paper survey. So lots of different ways to do it and helping, helping people walk through that process has um, improved our patient surveys a lot. Great. Great. It sounds like you're very committed to the process. Uh, I'll just add Grace's follow-up question there. She's curious about um, how community feedback was collected to inform the gap analysis. Might you be able to speak to that? Cheryl? <laughs> sure, I can speak to that. What we did with the gap analysis itself, we as a grouping, sat down and looked at where we felt that it was coming from. But you also have to remember it's that respect for the patient's values and the preferences and their expressed needs. So we also took it through to the steering committee, which has um, the two Gookums, the um, two moms, and the one mom has had how many children? Um, how many children does she have? Had to be about at least eight. And of that, the, the, the younger mom that was there was one of, the, uh, one of her children. And so she was so instrumental because she never, she breastfed the whole time. She was so good with those children and still continues to be to this day. And there's so many attributes that she brought forward that really complemented what we were all about. So when you look at that, you look at um, the steering committee we took each one and, and Greta was so good at going through it with those, with the individuals at that table. And then we had discussion of bringing forward what were the actual issues or what was identified as the gap analysis itself and how much of a priority was that for the individuals themselves. And what we found was the priorities were communication, looking at that person's standards. So we treat them as individuals with the respect that they deserve and the dignity. And they are the ones, is it meeting their needs? It may be meeting our needs, but is it meeting their needs? And if it's not, then we need to revisit that because just because we feel that it's important to us is first step, but it's certainly not the step to get that buy-in. And then from that, we then came up with the priorities. And again, once you start, if you've been involved in the process, looking at the priority matrix that we used, that's there. That's then where we set the priorities for moving forward. Great, thank you for that. Um, another question is about key strengths. 
And I'm, I'm identifying some strengths um, from, from your presentation and the answers to these questions, but I'm wondering what you think um, the four of you, or, um, or if you've identified this together, what do you think has been your key strength that has helped your community implement best practice spotlight organization? I feel it would be trust, building trust on each side with the client and with the worker. You have to be believed for what you say. You have to, you have to trust your doctor. You have to trust your worker. And they have to trust you too. Thank you. Yeah, I think for um, for our organization, it has been the just passion of the staff um, to to really um, make a difference in the communities that we're working in, and to really see better outcomes for people, um, and just in all in all aspects of their health. And so we've it's sort of been a natural fit in terms of. Like I said, it, it formalizes things that I think we're already doing well, um, and that's been a big, a big help to us to to sell it to staff and things is is just you know you're already doing all of these great things. It's it's really just us formalizing it and evaluating it in a lot of cases and just um, uh, showing showing that we are making a difference with all the hard work that we're doing. Great, thank you. I'm seeing other comments in the, the chat box. Um, people are, are really liking the, of the talking stick. They're finding the presentation informative and inspiring, really important key messages. And Elizabeth says communication in, and trust is, a consi is, is consistent regardless of the context. And uh, so thank you for reaffirming this foundation. Um, so thank you for that. And another um, question that I have is, what are your hopes uh, or your aspirations with BPSO for your community? Is there anything that comes to mind there? Cheryl? <laughs> One of the things I know, I know, what can I say? Um, I have been in the North now at Sandy Lake, more or less, for I'll be heading into my 10th year. First of all, I can't believe it, but it's such a privilege to be there. And I've had people say to me, thank you for staying. When I first started going there, I really, every time I left, I kept thinking, I'm going to go to another community. I'm going to go to another community. But if you go to another community, you can't build the trust that you build with working with this team. And when my aspirations are, is to, um, build capacity and that self-determination that goes with it because these three that i've been working with and i can't say enough good about them the three that i work with are just amazing as the doing the groundwork and really taking it forward with us as a team but they're really the leaders i'm kind of i don't know if you've ever seen on the internet that one picture of the uh, wolves going through the bush and is talking about leadership and team. And I, as a leader, I'm in the background. I'm at the very last. You get the ones that are the older ones that are in the very front, and they are the ones that keep the pace. So that with our steering committee, sometimes they help us keep our pace. But on the other hand, then you've got the stronger ones that are in the center. And I see these two here and Carmel as the stronger with Joan and with Ambrose. And then you get other ones as well. They're there to also protect. And then you get other ones that are within that community. And I'm at the last because I come and go. My mind never leaves there, but my body does. And so we are often on the phone or on the internet discussing planning as well. And when you look at all of this, it's like, let's build the capacity. Let's give the power to those that should have it. Let's start with the prenatal program. But within the prenatal program, we've got so many other areas that we can branch into because there's substance use, 
there is the mental health component that's that's related on both sides. Then it's the, these moms that then go into the well child program. They go into the older children within the schools. And so they, with the Gukums, have so much influence with the steering committee on what does happen. So I really believe we're in the right um, section. One, it was a small group. It was a control group that we had for up to 40 weeks. But on the other hand, they influence so many others. So I think I just went in a circle, but that's okay. Because it really shows, you know, it really speaks to me because it's that respect, it's the values, it's the preferences and it's the expressed needs that they have. And it's, we need to keep everyone informed. And we haven't been doing as good a job at that as we want to because life takes over and there's so many other things that we need to do. And these ladies have had um, kickoffs or launches. They've, we've worked with the steering committee. We need to keep that strong within the steering committee. And that's part of the hope too. So I'll back, I'll back away at this point, but um, I just can't say enough that, uh, about this all. Great, thank you so much for that answer. And um, I just have one last comment from Robin. Um, thank you for sharing all your work. What an excellent collaboration, such beautiful results and findings, building community capacity and leading people in community to be empowered to do their very good work. Keep it up, everyone. And uh, I wish I worked in Sandy. <laughs> <laughs> wanted to say for anyone who doesn't speak Ojibwe or Ojikri, Gukum is um, the word for grandmother. So these are the grandmothers in the community. <laughs> I love it. I love the word. I wish that when my kids uh, ask me to choose a word, uh, I would have known it. It's just beautiful. Um, so first of all, thank you, uh, Sandra. Uh, for doing both the land recognition and for uh, being our leader in uh, Danish Navi Mushkiki uh, Health Center BPSO, and to Greta, Lindsay, and Cheryl uh, from Sandy Lake First Nations. Thank you for the work you guys do. Uh, much appreciated. Um, I know Cheryl for a long time, and Cheryl, you have been just a beacon of. Um, you say my body lives, but my heart stays. Well, you go and go all the time. So I think it's more than your body, uh, more than your heart stays there. So thank you for the long-term commitment that you have had. Uh, and to all of you for, for working with uh, Sabrina and working with uh, Grace and working with Tanya and of course, uh, Heather in the background and Matt. And so thank you so very much for the commitment, you guys, at the home office. Uh, and I think everybody learned a lot today and, and more with the months and years to come. So for sure, we will ask you to come back. And maybe in the next time that you come back, we ask that you bring some actually members from the community and see how they feel they have benefited from the, from the BPSO journey. Uh, and I think it will be exciting to, to hear directly with them alongside with you. Um, are there any other questions? There, there is one oh, last question. I'll just put this one up so people have got the date for the next webinar. Um, as I'm reading out this next question, or the last question I see from Caitlin, and this is going back, Doris, to what you were talking about earlier. So Do uh, Caitlin is a team leader RN of Trent Student Health Services. And she's wondering about cam um, campus primary care clinics and how they fit into this model. So she says that her nurses and clinical staff are paid for by student fees and doctors are billed, um, billed through OHIP. Therefore, it's partially private for lack of a better term. So the healthcare model, um, okay, but we're, they're dependent on the healthcare system for referrals and uh, for student support and they serve 800 students. And so she's just wondering about the integration of that sort of um, team in the model. Yeah, so it's interesting that you are a, a commenting on that 
because when I went to the announcement of the minister on the revisions to the Home Care Act, uh, I had received an email from uh, a person, a nurse, in one of these um, university uh, health um, clinics, um, and about pretty serious things, things related to suicidal ideation of students. Uh, as you know, we have had suicides, uh, successful suicides in um, various universities. Uh, so I did mention to the minister that I thought that some of the care coordinators um, and also some of the mental health nurses that actually are in your train and ended up also at the LIM, that they should be uh, perhaps uh, relocated into um, other settings. And I gave examples and um, a, a high-level high or a university and college a health, health clinics was one of the ones that I used. So I would appreciate if you send some type of email on that, that you would benefit because the reality is that now these health clinics in the universities and in the colleges will be able in the future to apply uh, to provide primary care services, more comprehensive primary care services, including also some home care and home care for students means the dorm in the university. So um, with our policy team, we, are we have talked about shelters, we have talked about correctional facilities, uh, we have talked about street health. Um, dorms in universities and colleges is not different. And um, I mean, I am aware, uh, unfortunately, uh, through personal experience of, of a, a friends of ours, uh, that they found their own son. Um, a, I believe two days later, uh, because was not answering to the phone calls uh, in a dorm. So uh, uh, please send an email on that. Um, universities are struggling with the issue of mental health and addictions. Uh, and I think uh, getting some of these resources for you guys uh, is very apropos. And it doesn't matter that the doctors are compensated through OHIP uh, because so are they in other models in the community. So universities are no different and you should be able to apply to that. And we certainly can give you a hand, whether it's with a letter of support or something, and we can guide you where to look on when we know when is the application, how to do the application, etc. Because people are starting to write those proposals as we speak. So thank you for the question. And Doris, there's one other question here from David. He's asking, what is the best way to continue this momentum towards bringing evidence-based practice and RNAO BPGs to rural and remote First Nations communities? Would it be helpful to send more nurses and health care professionals to these communities? If so, is there enough funding? <clears throat> so um, there are two things. So you're talking about HR, first of all. Should we send more nurses or for that matter other health professionals? Uh, and the second is how can we keep the momentum? Let me answer the easiest one, which is the ladder. Um, because uh, we hope that we will be able to expand the BPSO uh, model, uh, both of OHT, if indigenous communities want at some point to join OHT, or in some communities there are um, a indigenous partners involved, uh, but also separate from the OHTs, we hope that we will be able to expand what Sabrina and her team are doing with the BPSOs in indigenous communities and bring next year more on board. So that's one piece. Uh, the second piece is we certainly can put um, a summary using what we did for the other summaries. Uh, that we have done for different topics. We can use a summary of all the resources RNAO has in an organized way mm -hmm. so people can uptake that uh, for communities where you are working, for those of you that are not BPSOs, uh, and we can commit to do that in a matter of a month or so, so that can be posted and you can use it. 
Uh, on the issue of HR, and I will ask Matt to comment um, after the, my brief remarks on this. Uh, I don't think I don't think that this um, way that we have of doing things of let's send on more people uh, is really the right response. Uh, that's my personal view as CEO for the many years I have been here. I see it as exactly what. Cheryl said, uh, Cheryl said, uh, and Cheryl is the best case scenario. There are much worse case scenarios of um, people really coming and going for a whole variety of reasons uh, and not necessarily always leaving their heart even behind. Uh, our approach, I think, should be more about grow your own and ensuring that we help secure the funding so that they can identify people in the community, they can make it exciting for the communities uh, to um, have people want to join, whether it's nursing, medicine, physio, social work, etc. And we'll be there to support them both in the political maneuvering of that, if they need our help, not all need our help, and in the policy and in the education helping with the education program if there is any need. And as it relates to bringing more people, uh, just after the meetings that we have had with some of the communities and uh, with the chiefs, uh, I'm absolutely convinced that they need, to be, they need to be the drivers in that seat. They need to be absolutely have a say of who comes, when people come, the part of the training, have a say, you know what I mean? Almost to be the, the um, HR, so to speak, hiring, and not that people are just sent um, there because, because there is such a need. I don't know, Matt, if you have uh, a different perspective or want to expand to it. Yeah, not, not at all a different perspective. I think the, the fundamental lesson from uh, much of the webinar is about uh, listening uh, to the communities and the, the answers aren't going to come out of home office at RNAO. It's going to eventually emerge out of a collaboration and, and discussion and dialogue with uh, the communities that need uh, better health care. Um, one thing I think that's clear is that the agency system of uh, staffing nursing stations is is not a sustainable one. Oh, sorry. Okay, it, the it's agency broken. It, has been broken all along. Yeah, and it's not a sustainable one. And we, we certainly uh, hear this from uh, the Anishinaabe Ashkenazi Nation that there are concerns with the cultural safe with cultural safety as as an issue with the nursing. Um, that's being provided uh, now. So to Doris's point, I think ultimately the issue is about um, growing um, the uh, health human resources from uh, First Nations, and that can include um, laddering uh, health professionals, uh, so RPNs and RNs. assessment. Yeah. Um, but it goes right, the, the issue ultimately goes right back to social determinants in the education systems in the communities that, that need um, support and, as Doris mentioned, funding. Uh, the last thing I'd point out that we've certainly heard is the issue of infrastructure in these communities, that um, many of the communities that are in need of uh, more health human resources simply don't have the infrastructure to accommodate more. There is a housing crisis uh, in most of these communities um, that does not allow for uh, more nurses, for example, to come into the community and, and have a place to live even. So, and, and to build on that, I mean, just picture if we can support communities on Grow Your Own and on securing the funding to grow your own, what, a, what source of hope and of revitalizing will be for kids and young people that they can look forward to a career, whether it's nursing, whether it's social work, whether it's community, I, I don't know. I just think that in itself will become just a driver of, of hope. Uh, I would be interested on comments also, thank you, Matt, of Cheryl and of, um, of Greta, Lindsay and Sandra 
uh, of your views on this because you you are there what what's your view on the answer to our colleague that asked the important question i think um i think you've hit it on the head in terms of you know it's the communities themselves that are really going to move this forward um i do know cheryl might know this i believe it's deer lake is an example of a community that has now moved away from um, having health canada or Indigenous Services Canada supply them with health resources and that they themselves are actually taking that over and it's it's a model that is actually becoming more um, prevalent in a lot of the communities and whether they're doing it individually themselves as communities or they're coming together in something like um, a health authority or a tribal council or something that is helping a group of communities deliver those services um, but I think um, um, you know, also to the point of just there, there are systemic issues in terms of um, housing and training and things like that that need to be worked at as well um, to get that in place. But certainly the best answer is the communities themselves having, having that capacity and bringing those people out of, um, up, bringing them up and out of their own communities for sure. Does that, any, anyone else that would like to comment? Uh, I'm Doris, it's Cheryl. I'm really excited about your title and about April the 20th. And as soon as I get done, I'm gonna register for it. That health system transformation webinar. Because when I look at this and we've been talking so much about it with, with Lindsay and Greta and Carmel and so on, and also with my zone manager, to see how we can work in a different way because it is not working the way it is. Yes, we have a new building that's, that's in process right now. We're, hoping, we're opening a health center. We're hoping in um, January of next year, we haven't had a date at this point, it was supposed to be September. But when you look at it, we've already outgrown it. And with the station with where we are, we um, thank goodness that I had the opportunity to work with the manager that I have and she was able to get some trailers in and we're able to put some of our programs within those two trailers and we've overflowed from those as well. And so when you look at where people are at, the care, we can't even get upstream to do pre prevention. We are still swimming downstream and, and the number of urgent and emergent, I came home with two weeks that probably have been the busiest that I've seen in nine years and the week prior to that as well. And Greta will affirm this as well. And so when you look at that, it's like, how can we do this in a different way with the resources that we have? Because we have some resources, but we also need to look at how we're working together. This is Sioux Lookout First Nations Health Authority that we have in place that are bringing practitioners in just as you speak to. They're bringing a interdisciplinary, interprofessional team in we don't have the space to put them. I would dearly love, first of all, for to give them a bed to sleep in. I keep jokingly say you're going to get the TP, TP in the courtyard um, because we just don't have a bed short of us moving over and letting them uh, climb in. But it's, the, it's looking at even the rooms, let alone the accommodation, the rooms to be able to do that because as soon as I do, then I'm giving away space that our nurses that are in the clinic doing the work that they need to do there, um, we're jeopardizing that, that as well. And they're already playing musical rooms to be able to provide the care that they can. Yeah, yeah. So um, just so you know, we have a well over a hundred people listening to you, rowing with you and for you and on your side. And uh, we will continue the dialogue and we will continue to hear uh, both from a policy perspective where we are moving um, and also uh, from Sabrina and you guys on where the BPSO is moving and hopefully we will be able to bring more on board. Um, let's see where it goes. And yes, let's hear the communities uh, on the issue of human resources, not only on BPSO because uh, it can keep going this way. So thank you, thank you very much. Okay, 
we will see you or those of you that are interested on April 20th.